the heart, life's natural pump, and the center of human passion and compassion. At Medela, we combine these aspects. Through global partnerships with leading researchers, we transform valuable knowledge into innovative clinical solutions. For over 50 years, we deliver high-quality Swiss medical vacuum solutions that now include adaptable surgical suction and convenient, easy-to-use portable suction systems for various applications in hospitals, clinics or home care. Healthcare professionals value the reliability, user-friendliness and quietness that come from Medela suction pumps. Continuing our success in developing cutting-edge solutions, we proudly present our next generation of suction pumps, basic and dominant flex. The power of choice is at your fingertips. You can choose 40 liters per minute for whisper quiet operation, 50 liters per minute for most applications, or 60 liters per minute for turbo performance. Optimized hygienic design allows for simplicity when cleaning. Swiss quality and reliability integrated in a functional and modern design. You also have the choice of fully compatible fluid collection systems and accessories. Basic and dominant flex. The solution for all surgical suction needs. The pioneering chest drainage therapy system, Topaz Plus, digitally measures air, fluid and pressure. And customized negative pressure wound therapy enhances performance, patient comfort and controlling costs. Life is precious and it needs passionate people to provide progressive care working in partnership to save lives. Medela is all about true customer care. When you call, we answer. If you look for advice, we provide assistance. If you need support, we train and instruct you. Basic and dominant flex, offering you the power of choice at your fingertips. Hygienic, reliable, and user-friendly, all at a whisper. Contact us for more information. We'd just like to make a quick audio and video check, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, everyone. Maliktad ba yung logo ko? Hindi. Pwede, pwede. Nakorek na, nakorek na. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Hi, Kathy. Thank, thank you. you for attending. Hi, Kapala. Good afternoon. Oh, oh. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, oh, Dilpo. Thank you for gracing our meeting. Good afternoon, ma'am. Maganda lahat ang tunog natin, ha? Ah, uh, okay. okay. So, I think Sorry, you, okay. Bring audio po. Maganda, Sorry. maganda. Malakas naman, Doctor. Gwapo pa. Ay, man, hindi lang maganda audio. Gwapo pa video. Di ba? Gwapo. <laughs> Kagalang-galang. <laughs> Sobrang kagalang-galang. Siyempre, <laughs> siyempre. Oh, I think marami registrants natin na, no? So, the, um, the participants are coming in pa as we speak. But I think we can start on time naman, ano? Yeah. Okay, so everybody's audio is okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sige. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Fawi. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Thank you po. Okay, ma'am. Thank you.
Heavenly Father, we praise you for your blessings are abundant. Your hand is strong and your mercy is boundless. In these trying times, you have allowed us to become together as we seek to enhance the faculties you have given us. Bless our society and our speakers. Grant us the ability to share our expertise to our colleagues as we continue to be of service to your people. We pray for all those who are with us today. Keep us safe. Protect our colleagues and our families. Heal those afflicted by the virus and welcome to your kingdom our dearly departed. We pray that this occasion may empower us and offer new ways to continue providing health care to our fellow men in this time of need. May the success of this meeting and the knowledge we share today bear fruit of your greater glory. Amen. To formally welcome you to this webinar, here is Dr. Miguel Galvez. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I pressed it. Uh, once again, good afternoon. Uh, special guests, uh, doctors, nurses, residents, interns, clerks, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to a second of uh, a series of webinars uh, developed by the Phili Philippine Surgical Infection Society in collaboration with the Philippine College of Surgeons and the Perioperative Registered Nurses Association of the Philippines. So with that, I would like to give up the floor and uh, to hear a message from our president. So welcome everybody. Now for a message from the president of the Philippine College of Surgeons, Dr. Jose Antonio Sadu. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar of the Philippine Surgical Infection Society. As we have been working under the COVID cloud for the past five months, the need to innovate and devise new methods of ensuring safe surgeries in an environment lacking in essential resources is now the norm. Every little development and changes on how we can provide appropriate patient safety during surgery and management in critical areas of the hospital at this time is most welcome. Thus, such webinars as what we have today is good for all of us and I am sure it will be informative and it's sharing to the surgical community around the country is something we encourage. The PSIS, an independent organization made up of healthcare workers with special interest in surgical infections, as well as infections that develop as a result of a procedure, will hopefully be part of the PCS as an official affiliate society in due time. May I thus arouse among the surgeons, nurses, and others interested in this field to join us and be members of this relatively young organization. For your information, this group has already made its mark in the form of successfully having the government issue Presidential Proclamation Number 971, 
dated June, June 23rd, 2020, declaring the second week of every July as a National Infection and Prevention Week and the second Saturday of every July as Surgical Infection Prevention Awareness or CPA Day. And this was highlighted with a virtual inaugural commemoration last July 11. We are excited with the future of the PSIS, ably headed by Esther Sagil, who is also our speaker for this webinar. And so on behalf of the Board of Regents of the Philippine College of Surgeons, I wish the P Philippine Surgical Infection Society the best and hope this webinar provides new and crucial information we all need in our surgical practice. We are firmly behind the PSIS in setting the standards in the OR and in the ICU. More power to the PSIS and of course, to the Perioperative Registered Nurses Association of the Philippines, previously known as the ORNAP or the Operating Room Nurses Association of the Philippines, who have been our close partners in the drama that unfolds within all the operating theaters in the country. Mabuhay kayong lahat, mabuhay tayong lahat, at salamat po. To introduce today's speaker, we have Dr. Ukenko. Hello. Yes, wait. Excuse me. Hi, uh, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Uikienko, and I would like to present our speaker for today. Um, she is the driving force in the Committee on Surgical Infection um, of the PCS. And of course, our president in the Philippine Surgical Infection Society. Um, she is a pediatric surgeon she is a hospital administrator, and she is a very strong advocate of uh, surgical infection prevention. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Esther Sagil. Let us welcome our key speaker, Dr. Esther Sagil. Good afternoon. Thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. I'm here to talk about setting standards in the OR and ICU as a critical response to the COVID pandemic of 2020. Yesterday, the Philippine Daily Inquirer came out with a report of DOH that 6,735 medical frontliners have already gotten COVID and of which 40 have already died. And these are crime statistics that we do not want repeated anymore. The objectives of this talk are to present the challenges brought on by this pandemic in the healthcare setting and discuss the adaptations in the healthcare setting necessary to ensure that infection prevention and control is practiced in surgery and of course offer solutions to minimize infectious disease transmission in the OR and other critical care environments. We all know about infection and, and what is necessary to do is to break this chain in order to prevent disease transmission. You've probably seen this inverted pyramid before, and this is the hierarchy of hazard control. We keep on hearing on the news that vaccination is very important and we're all waiting for vaccination. But while waiting for vaccination, we should be doing something to at least mitigate the problem. PPEs are actually just at the lowest part of the pyramid because they're an individual response to hazard. Uh, next to that is administrative controls. And in this talk, we'll be talking more about engineering controls, which is what we have adapted so that we can control the spread of disease. We've been told that the COVID-19 is transmitted primarily by droplet, but we do know that aerosols can be transmitted too. And at sizes of less than five micrometers, the droplet nuclei may be actually be inhaled towards your alveoli, leading to very severe infection. During the SARS epidemic, they were able to determine that during suctioning before intubation in two cohort studies, almost 60% will get COVID, the SARS infection. So basing that, knowing that SARS is actually the big sister of COVID, 
we are able to extrapolate some of the learnings in SARS to how we're managing COVID now. Regarding endotracheal suctioning, we have learned that about 20% of COVID sufferers will require hospitalization and about five of them will need to go to the ICU for critical care support. And that is where ventilation and suctioning will be needed because most of them will have respiratory symptoms. So in these cases, a vacuum source and suction regulator are recommended for every treatment space, which means it's per patient to cover multiple patient management areas. We need to know that the air keep is patent. It's kept patent because it is a life-saving procedure. That's why intubation, tracheostomy, they're done you know, for these patients who develop respiratory symptoms. And for these patients, endotracheal suction must be available for all mechan mechanically ventilated patients so that the secretions are removed in a timely manner. And in these cases, it's the mobile suction that prevents viral spread, not just from one patient to the other, but also from patient to healthcare worker. This suction pumps must have filters and accessories to help prevent the spread of viruses in care centers. And they're actually listed in the WHO booklet for SARS infection. When doing endotracheal suction, it should be done, if at all, should be done in a closed manner, closed suction system manner, and it should be performed very cautiously. So those with disposable collecting systems must be available in the critical care setting. When preparing patients for intubation, those with COVID, with proven or probable COVID-19, there are several ways by which you can mitigate exposure and potential transmission of disease. One is by using full PPEs, and that is where uh, wearing of PAPRs and full gowns may be done. Notice how sealed okay, the mask is to the patient's face. Video laryngoscopy is now preferred over the conventional laryngoscope. Uh, in the UK, they pioneered these aerosol boxes, but in the Philippines, after trying it out for one to two months, we found it very bulky. So here, uh, most people who intubate actually like using the plastic drapes, the clear plastic drapes more in the lower pressure to at least lessen the transmission of droplets or aerosols as they do the intubation. Of course, the number of staff has to be minimized and all those who are not critical to this process, the intubation process should leave the room. Regarding going back to surgery safely, we all know that all elective surgeries in virtually all areas affected by COVID had to stop. And we resorted to just doing the emergencies and the urgent cases. But now, starting June, we've already started doing elective surgeries. But it has to be a safe and comprehensive strategy because we cannot afford a second wave. And the um, um, strategies by which we can control this is by isolating COVID-19 treatment facilities, which we currently are already doing here in the Philippines, prioritizing surgical cases such that uh, we first um, schedule patients who have long delayed surgeries and who have probably malignancies, or cardiac problems, which really need uh, urgent surgeries. We also, both the American College of Surgeons and the Philippine College of, uh, College of Surgeons have also taken to recommend screening surgical patients for COVID-19 using RT-PCRs, not antibody testing. And the fourth is maintaining a safe and clean and hospital environment, which we are about uh, to talk about. So what is our critical response in the intraoperative environment? These are the four things that you have to consider. What is the condition of the OR ventilation? Do we have negative pressure in that OR? Number two, how do we minimize the dispersion of aerosols, which we can do using suction and viral filters or even smoke evacuation? Number three, how to do cleaning, disinfecting, and sterilization, and using environmental sanitation methods such as UVC irradiation. And number four is appropriate PPEs, which I have not uh, included in this lecture. Let's, let's, talk, let's say something about room pressurization. I'm sure everybody has been dying to know what negative pressure is all about. So what's the rationale for room pressurization? Uh, the American Society of Health Engineering has defined um, what room press, pressurization is all about. And it has something to do like this. A room has to be pressurized so that it's positive with respect to the other areas. And the reasons I, you have to protect the patients in the operating rooms, in the clean rooms, and you have to protect sterile medical supplies and surgical supplies. So usually the positively pressured rooms are usually the cleanest environments in a hospital. These are the examples of other positively pressured rooms in the regular, during regular times, ORs, DRs, the NICU, 
uh, pharmacy and lab, and the CSSDs. If you have a positive pressure room, then you also have a negative pressure room. So these are the examples of negative pressure rooms. These are the ERs, radiology waiting areas. Uh, I highlighted airborne infection isolated air rooms or areas. The pathology area where the cytology is being done, nuclear med, autopsy rooms, and areas where there is soilage. For an airborne infection isolation room, it has to be negatively pressurized with respect to the other areas to prevent the contaminants inside the room from drifting to the other area. So it's keeping it in. But it just doesn't mean keeping it in the room, but rather there should be an exhaust, a controlled exhaust to take out okay, this contaminated air without having to contaminate the rest of the areas. One very common use for airborne infection isolation rooms actually is um, when there is a patient with active tuberculosis, because since the bacteria is readily spread by air from one person to the other, we normally would request a um, patient with active tuberculosis to be placed in a negative pressure room. Unfortunately, this has been um, an advice or recommendation has been poor, poorly appreciated and followed, but now with COVID, suddenly everybody's talking about negative pressure room. So in pathology and histo labs, there's a substantial amount of chemicals, in, uh, including formaldehyde and other airborne chemicals, which can cause unpleasant odors and some allergies in other people. So in these areas, negative pressure is also recommended. Now about operating room ventilation, we there is a recommendation there should be at least 20 air exchanges per hour in the OR. Okay, so how do you do that? You have to reduce the amount of equipment in the OR. And remember, our ORs do not open windows to the external environment. So if you're going to have laminar flow, it may be distorted if you have additional equipment or personal in the room. What we do is we install HEPA filters to remove aerosols and droplets. And we find that technically there's no need to convert all rooms to negative pressure rooms, but modalities such as in-room air filters or air, what we call uh, air purifiers and antechambers may be considered. Minimizing the number of people in the OR at all times, particularly during aerosol generating procedures, is also very important to lessen the risks of exposure. Of, we call it the high-grade exposure. The Philippine Society of Medical Biology and Infectious Diseases came out with guidelines last May, and they recommended the use of HEPA filters. HEPA means, stands for high-efficiency particulate air, which can also mean high-efficiency particulate absorbing and arrestance. So they're typically made of fiberglass and they're able to filter at 99.95%. So that's very high already, you know? But this is when the particles are more than 0.3 micrometers. It also allows efficient uh, filtration, the rate at which the machine allows uh, the air to pass through. So HEPA is actually for air filtration. It does not ventilate. Uh, you have to follow some parameters and the manufacturers have recommendations regarding how big your filter has to be for a particular size of a room. So this is very important. You don't just buy a HEPA filter or an air purifier, but you don't know how effective that HEPA filter or air purifier is going to be with respect to the size of the room. There is a, now an available uh, movable or portable negative pressure machine. So why do we say that this is a very good um, equipment? Having a negative, it's expensive to set up a negative pressure machine. So if you have a movable or portable negative pressure machine, that will guarantee you can generate negative pressure in each room and you can move it from one room to the other depending on whether, where you're going to use it. So the currently available movable negative pressure machine actually has ULPA grade filters capable of filtering up to a 0.125 micrometer. So this is very small, it's much smaller. And these are very low noise, so they will not interfere Okay, with the hospital, with the OR environment. The nice thing about this is because they also have UV lamps. They need to have external remote control so you don't get scared you know, that you have to turn it on, enter the COVID room. You can actually turn it on remotely. So this can be used in a clean room facility such as any ORs that are already existing or any ICUs that are already existing. Okay, so these machines have not just HEPA filters, but ULPA filters, which can filter, filter up to 0.1 micrometer. So it gives you a lot of assurance when it comes to uh, filtration of the air. These portable machines like the BNC-1 uh, SO400 is ex equipped not just with ULPA filters, but also with UV lamps, which additionally sterilize the room. 
So in terms of uh, minimizing the dispersion, so you already have the HEPA filters or OPA filters, but during the procedure itself, you also have to know the tricks on how to minimize dispersion. And one of the tricks that we do is to get the plastic kidney basin and put it around okay, an instrument like a laparoscope or um, the toker so that whenever there's air being uh, extruded or seeping out, it can stay within this kidney basin. It can be suctioned directly into the suction machine. During laparoscopy, what we recommend is to close the port taps for insertion and attach the CO2 filter to one of the ports for smoke evacuation. But then, as much as possible, you want to minimize the use of cauterization so you don't produce too much smoke. We advise not to open any of the taps of any ports unless they're attached to the filter or that being used to deliver the gas. Also to reduce introduction and removal of ports. So you want to be careful that you don't say that it's a wrong instrument, take it out, put it in again, because you want to lessen as much as possible seepage of air. Okay. We also recommend deflating the abdomen, the suction device, before removing the specimen bag from the, oven, uh, from the abdomen in case you do have a specimen, and to deflate the abdomen with a suction device or via port. So that is well from the start. There were really a lot of um, there were a lot of questions about how to do laparoscopy properly or safely during the COVID pandemic. But you know, after enough study, after enough trials and uh, determination of how you can get, knowing a lot of how you can get the COVID virus, just by knowing this, you know that you can do laparoscopy safely now. There are just a lot of, uh, just some things that you have to know. So some words about surgical smoke inhalation. Even before COVID, if you look at the operators, operating manuals of all your cautery machines, it says there that the surgical plume or the surgical smoke has to be evacuated or suctioned out because they are hazardous. They can be carcinogenic. And experts actually estimate the amount of surgical smoke produced daily in the OR is about 27, it equals 27 to 30 cigarettes. So you're actually a one pack, you smoker every time you burn one gram of tissue. So that's very important that you ask your assistant to suction it out. Now, because of concerns of coronavirus uh, surviving in the surgical pool, it's even the more, uh, more important now to suction that air or that smoke during the surgery. And what you have now is smoke evacuation systems, which is nothing more. It's a very simple device, but it's very helpful where the suction and the cautery are kept together in one device so that as soon as you burn tissue, there's um, smoke generated, it is automatically suctioned out into a closed suction system so you don't get to inhale. You know, so the dictum is don't inhale. Just another step up in reducing smoke and aerosol spread in laparoscopic management, but all it means is uh, keeping it all within this system so it goes directly to the suction from the laparoscope down to the suction tubing and out. We do have suction machines now that are suitable for both ICU and OR needs. And in these patients, um, this can be battery operated so that if you don't have a socket, it can still work. And they have to have disposable virus filters and disposable fluid collection systems. In the UK, there is already medical uh, guidance regarding vacuum. So most hospitals actually have port of, um, piped in um, vacuum or suction. There is some concern about piped in vacuums because cross contamination can actually occur. So there is guidance from the UK National uh, Health Service that they do recommend portable suction units because these can be removed and sterilized before being used for another patient and also for the safety of the healthcare work. A medical virus filter is nothing more than a virus uh, filter that is attached to this. This is it, that's the filter and it's attached to the suction machine so that the virus retention inside that filter is very high at 99.99984. Okay. And it filters all types of coronavirus. So it makes everything safe. Your manong or your institutional worker, the janitor who cleans your suction machines is not exposed because the viruses are trapped in the filters. They're high performance and very dedicated and it can make everybody much safer in the operating room and in the IC. Also, the canisters, the ones that are continuous, your waste, your washings, the blood, they should have overflow protection. So they should not be freely flowing so that it doesn't, it just overflows and this, you know, spreads everything. And this overflow protection on top, they have to have filters. 
so that the viruses can be trapped in these filters and not spread. They prevent the fluid from contaminating the central vacuum system if you do have a piped in vacuum system or the other suction source, uh, sources. With regards to surgical fluids, are actually, um, it's very important that the fluids don't spill. And I've seen it happen so many times. Liquids during suctioning can spill if the bag that suctions, that where the fluid goes to is perforated, if the lid is uh, perforated or torn, or it doesn't secure properly, or the manufacturer has used a thinner or inferior material, or the healthcare was had a slip, slip up. And it's, there are studies that show that nearly 38% of uh, registered nurses experience splashes which are, not, which are not acceptable because this really exposes our nurses, our staff to potential for infection. And this is uh, very scary when it comes to the COVID-19 infection. So what are must-have items in the OR? We would like to have the canisters in the suction, which have pre filled solidifying agents. So this is nothing more like a gelling agent for your fluids. Once the fluid enters the suction machine in this uh, bag, it becomes solid. So it reduces aerosol gen uh, generation. It gives you peace of mind knowing that you won't get exposed to contaminated liquids. With regards to chest drainage, and I think you're all aware that the main problem of COVID patients is pneumonia, severe pneumonia. And in some of these ventilated patients, they do develop barotrauma for which they will require uh, chest tube drainage. Our conventional chest tube drainage have a positive pressure valve at the top of the device and it allows exit of the virus into the environment, particularly when the patient coughs. And that is scary if the patient has COVID. So to combat that, there is a product like the Topaz that has an effective defense against harmful devices because it has an integrated filter on the top, okay? So it has a filter, so it will retain the pathogen-sized uh, particle. So it makes the environment of the ICU or the OR or the PACU much safer. Now, how about the post-operative environment? After surgery, the patient is wheeled out back to the ICU. The nurses and the staff inside the OR are still concerned about how that room and how the instruments and equipment are going to be cleaned, disinfected, and sterilized. As again, we already know that the main mode of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is still respiratory in respiratory droplets and contact because SARS-CoV-2 can remain viable. Proven three hours in the aerosol, eight hours in copper, 24 hours on paper, 48 hours on stainless steel. I was surprised about that. And 72 hours in plastic. So because of this, aerosol and permit transmission, although probably low, not likely, is still plausible. And in cleaning and in cleaning of instruments and environment, it's still the physical action of scrubbing with detergents and rinsing with water that removes the large numbers of germs, bacteria, viruses from surfaces. So this is the most useful method for removing viruses on commonly touched surfaces or what we call high touch surfaces. Thankfully, in the hierarchy of pathogen killed by disinfectants, Envelope viruses like coronavirus is actually the easiest to kill. So for the most part, it's everything should be routine when you clean and disinfect. And I think everybody knows it's done routinely. But what do we need to say? It's the key exception that you need to use an EPA registered product. EPA is Environment, Environmental Protection Agency. Why is this important? I don't know if some of you are aware that there was a policeman who died after being misted with a, with a disinfectant, which turned out to be undiluted, that can cause severe allergies and respiratory symptoms. So we ramp up cleaning and disinfection of environmental surfaces, especially those that are high touch and allow time to air. Okay, so you don't go in while the floor is still wet, while all the surfaces are still wet. You have to allow time to air and dry before everybody enters for the terminal cleaning, and especially more so for the next case. So for environmental cleaning in the COVID OR, cleaning is crucial and it should be systematic and coordinated. Okay. We've seen and found that agents with antiviral activity like just 72% alcohol, 0.1% uh, sodium hypochlorite or 0.5% hydrogen peroxide are actually already effective in uh, as viricidal agents. 
And we also know that benzalkonium chloride and fluorhexidine are less effective. There are also hospital grade disinfectants that are approved at FDA. But again, we have to emphasize that infection risk does not end with the operation. Everything has to be clean and disinfected uh, until ready for reuse. And that includes even the BP set stethoscopes and the like. Just some words about UV, because I know you've been here about it, everything has to go UV, surface infection. So how do this work? They generate, um, this UV uh, lights generate, uh, they destroy microbial nucleic acid, and there is a specific range okay, of wavelength. That's the 240 to 280, that's the UVC range. Um, there are now a lot of home grade UV sterilizers, like those for baby bottles or even handheld devices. No, but what we talk about is uh, there are specific um, recommendations and guidelines when using UV light to sterilize operating rooms and um, critical care environments. The PISMID came out with these guidelines. Okay. It's, the guidelines are actually telling you what you should know about UV lights. And one is it shadows. That means you have to have the least number of equipment inside a room that you want to uh, expose to UV light. Because otherwise, if there are many instruments and many equipment there, you're not going to obtain your target because there are going to be obstructions. The wavelength and the light intensity is important. It has to be optimal, and that's manufacturer dependent. If you have high humidity places, they increase the uh, injurious effects of UV light. And thankfully, SARS-CoV-2 is one of those that's easily destroyed by UVC. For the record, UV light is not effective against bacterial spores. The exposure time is also very important. It is dependent on the intensity of the UV light. And the farther an equipment or a surface is from the UV light source, the intensity of the light uh, decreases. So that means the sterilization will also be suboptimal. There is a very, these are the various um, device considerations that you have to think about. So apart from efficacy, you want to be, you want it to be portable because you can move it from one room or area to the other. It has to be durable because you don't want it to be uh, non-functional after one month. Okay? It has to be easily, uh, easy to use and safe. And of course, everybody talks about how much is it. So the Moonbeam is one of those devices that's, um, I call it high tech because it has three arms and it moves vertically and horizontally so it can cover all surfaces. It's also very portable, so it makes it easy. Uh, the use is much easier. We want to um, expose to UV light. If you are going to consider the use of UV light for cleaning and disinfection, you want to expose as much as possible the frequently touched or high touch surfaces. And what are these high touch surfaces? That's the bed rails, the IV pumps, all the things that everybody just keeps on touching and, you know, you don't have your gloves. If you have your gloves, but you touch from one place to the other, you're actually the one um, spreading the virus. But there are also precautions when you uh, use UV. And it's our ophthalmology society that has issued the guidelines regarding this. It has been shown already in previous studies that UV induced skin irritation and keratoconjunctivitis can occur. So we are told, yes, you can use the UV light, but you're not supposed to be in the room with a UV lamp. And if you have to be exposed, avoid looking straight to the light source. So what we tell everyone is you limit the access to the area when the UV light is on, put everything, make a huge X there. So this should never be used when a clinic or an OR is ongoing. With the standard recommendation, it's, it's an adjunct to standard disinfection procedure. So what does adjunct mean? First, you clean, mop everything, wipe everything, and then you want to be, uh, you want to be very sure, then expose to UV light. And make sure that the UV product specifications are compliant with the minimum recommendations and that the protocol for using the, the equipment should follow the manufacturer's protocols because we have to be very safe. You have to really make sure that you are safe. So how about instrument cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization? So yeah, we're doing with under the room, but we now have to think about how we do the instrument cleaning and how we um, clean the rest of the environment. For non-critical equipment, which need cleaning and low-level disinfection, okay, regular detergent and household bleach are often not enough to remove blood and organic debris. 
And this is why sometimes you see your clamps having some more blood that seems it has already gone through the autoclave, but there's still organic debris there. And that's not good because biofilm, consider, um, that's biofilm, it does contain significant bio burden and can pose risk for infection. So after cleaning, or we call it the babad, okay, we have to soak. Soaking in anionic and neutral detergents, well, they should be in soaked in an appropriate disinfecting solution such as Precept. Precept is more effective than hypochlorites because it's sustained release. 50% stays initially as free as available chlorine, but 50, chlorine, but 50% combined will become available later on as it stays so. So there's a prolonged bactericidal and virucidal effect, and therefore uh, better infection control because there's make sure that the virus is killed. So for these solutions or wiping solutions, you don't do double dip. Double dip is you've already immersed something in it and then you take that out and then you immerse something else that's not acceptable. For semi-critical instruments such as endoscopes and laryngoscopes, these enter non-sterile body cavities. They need higher levels of disinfection. I'm sure those in my age group and a little older, they know about glutaraldehyde. Because for the longest time, if you drop an instrument, you need it, still need it for that surgery. You ask somebody to soak it now in 30 minutes so I can use it again. But we've shown that glutaraldehyde, okay, although it was, it is safe, but it has risks for irritation and potential toxicity. So now there's an upgrade that's, that's the taldehydes, the haldehydes. So we call it the Cydex OPA. This, the nice thing about the Cydex OPA is, unlike the regular Cydex where you just Babad for 30 minutes and then just take it out. With Cydex OPA, it has chemical indicators, so you can determine the efficacy of the solution after use. So you can use these solutions okay, in the ORs, in the GI departments, particularly for the endoscopes, in any part of the offices or healthcare settings where you need some higher level of disinfection without necessarily having to do sterilization. And for critical instruments such as laparotomy sets, uh, we need sterilization that is reliable. Okay? You can sterilize using steam, that's the autoclave. You can use red hydrogen, you can use plasma. And one of my, after the, we found out that we needed to re sterilize N95 masks because of the shortage, the steroid system is very effective because it's one of the plasma uh, sterilizers. So these sterilizers have biological indicators. So you're ensured, you're assured that your instruments are properly sterilized. Okay. So all these things that we've talked about are additional necessary standards that you have to start uh, putting in place in your ICUs and your ORs if you want to make sure that the, not only the patient is kept safe, but also the healthcare workers. Because I think everybody now knows that it is the, health work, the number of healthcare workers and manpower that is now creating the shortage. They're now being the, they're now the shortage, the manpower. In the past, they said it was a ventilator shortage. They said it was um, the ICU bed shortage. But now the DOH has already acknowledged that far more important than ventilators, far more important than the uh, I, the ventilators and the beds, it's actually the presence of the healthcare workers because once your healthcare, healthcare worker gets sick, that's a minimum of two weeks of quarantine. And if they do contract COVID-19, okay, God forbid that they uh, have severe critical disease, everything gets disrupted, the scheduling gets disrupted. So it's very important that at our level, we think about our safety at all times. So I think that's it. And for any questions, uh, you can address your questions here via email at the email address fieldsearchinfectionsoc.2018 at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening. Now we'll have an open forum moderated by Dr. Urquen. Uh, hello, hello. All right. Oh. Hi. Good afternoon. Um. All right. So. Okay. So, uh, before we 
before we um, go to the open forum, no, uh, I, I would like to um, ask uh, our reactors to prepare their um, statements, their reactions. No, so can we go first to Dr. Catherine Kolaiko, the vice, Pres uh, vice president of uh, FIX? Good afternoon, Doctor. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to thank you, uh, the PSIS, for the invitation to to uh, join you this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Sagil and commend the very, very comprehensive uh, coverage that she she did in the time given. Uh, and I'm glad that there was a lot of um, focus on the engineering. Uh, uh, aspects of infection control. Um, Dr. Ra is right. Much of the discussion has always been, even up to now, on, on uh, personal protective equipment. No? And understandably, it's because there's really a lot of uh, fear still and anxiety amongst the healthcare workers, especially every time there's a wave of new uh, healthcare workers falling. We are already falling short in hospital staff. Um, wherever, I'm sure in all hospitals. And so it is always a concern. But um, PPEs are limited and many of them cannot really be um, reused. And so there has to be an additional um, or a, a, a group of, of um, means to prevent infection. You know? And the ideal really in any area of the hospital, but more especially in the areas that are supposed to be sterile, the, the IC, the, the OR, you know, and areas that are critical, such as the ICU, it's very important really to practice um, all aspects of infection control. Um, doctor represented the inverted pyramid, you know, and um, all of these are cannot be individually done and be effective. You know, all of it has to come together. You may have very good engineering controls, but no protective equipment or the other way around, or you might have no policies at all in your hospital. And so every individual is just scrambling for themselves. You know? um, one duty time, they might be cleaning a particular way and another time a particular way. So all of these policies have to come together. But it's very important, in fact, to identify the, the need for um, environmental um, decontamination. You know? uh, there's been a lot said already previously about how to screen patients prior to surgery. Um, there's been a lot of debate on that and a lot of uh, questioning of uh, the expenses that go into this. But really, there's really a need to protect not only our patients and not only the 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 surgeons, but the whole the whole team. You know? So, um, I'd like to mention uh, about the, the the discussion on the on the decontamination. You no, know? um, these are actually standards really for for hospital grade decontamination. You no, know? as far as instruments go, they haven't really changed outside from, from the time of pre-COVID to COVID. You know, and I'm glad Doctora mentioned that, that also um, the, the coronavirus is actually uh, very uh, vulnerable, you know, very vulnerable to these disinfectants. But we cannot also be uh, lax in, in implementing these. You know? um, Doctora mentioned, okay, the patient has already been brought back to the room. You know? What else do we do? So of course, all of these uh, um, cleansing and all the cleaning and decontamination is necessary. And not only that, but of course, we have to re-emphasize that those who are responsible to do all of these cleaning have to protect themselves as well. You know? So they should also be provided with the proper PPEs, you know, such as the, the N95, you know, especially when you're cleaning and all of uh, uh, all splash protections, uh, especially because these are highly infective um, uh, pathogens. Uh, there was a mention on the HEPA filters, and um, I think one of the issues with many hospitals still up to now, and we get questions about that, is uh, 
these are all good to know, but they're also very expensive. No? So what do you do in the absence of these? And this is where uh, you will have to discuss it with your engineering teams as far as air exchanges go. And that is also where you have to be more meticulous with your environmental cleaning, uh, with your decontamination after the procedure, the terminal cleaning that goes into that, uh, what solutions to use. No, Doctora mentioned glutaraldehyde. I naabutan ko yon. No, I was in that batch, and um, yes, it is still effective, but there are toxicities associated with it, and so there have been um, amendments to that, and the side opa is one of that. Um, as far as uh, I wanted to, to just also touch on the surgical smoke, you know, and I'm glad Dr. also mentioned that because in the past we'd also get a lot of questions on that. Uh, the surgical smoke, can surgical smoke aerosolize the coronavirus? We really don't know. You know? Until now, there really is still no, uh, or there really aren't very strong evidences for it, but there aren't strong evidences that they don't. So. At this point, I think any uh, the hazards of surgical smoke in its in its um, ability or or capability of of uh, causing infection should be looked into. And if there is that potential, then that also has to uh, be addressed. And I and the caller is right. No, there was previously when this all started back in March, there was a lot of uh, apprehension about how do we conduct these surgeries? Can we do this? Can we do? endoscopies, laparoscopies, can we do all of this? No? Um, there was a lot of fear about handling these cases. And I think the data up to now is still evolving, but it's been five months, six months already since the time of the lockdown. And, um, and there have been surgeries already that, been, uh, that, that have been performed and uh, maximal protections are concerned. I think it is a reality really to really just invest also per institution on infection control measures. No? It might not be the HEPA filter, it might not be the portable um, negative pressure uh, machine, which would be so ideal really for, for many hospitals that do not have uh, negative pressure rooms. But the very basic still of infection control will still matter. You know? And those are the proper air exchanges recommended by the WHO and the CDC. Um, and this has to be worked out with hospital engineers as well. So thank you, Dr. Sagil. That was a really very, very comprehensive and very uh, interesting uh, uh, lecture. Thank you. Dr. George. Hello, yeah, all right. Uh, I was muted kanina. So um, let's let's hear from uh, the Perioperative um, Registered Nurses Association of the Philippines, uh, their president, uh, Mr. Gabriel Naig, for uh, their reaction on today's lecture. Thank you, Dr. Rakalaiko. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sir, naririnig Gab. po. Sir? Good afternoon, Gab. Good afternoon. Naririnig na po. Hello? Yeah, we just don't see you. Yes, opa. <laughs> Mayroong challenge Sir, yung video ko, opa. <laughs> Pasensya na po. Uh, yeah, yes, Sir Gab. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of ORNAP, I would like to extend our greatest uh, great appreciation to PCS, Dr. Salud, and uh, PCS President, Dr. Asagil, for always involving our organization in these endeavors as a continuing education program, likewise to the company partner, Centrum Med, for making this into a success. Dr. Saga's presentation is an excellent and practical guide in the performance of our role as perioperative practitioners. Her discussion likewise serves as a basis in formulating the guidelines and procedures, thus standards are set for infection control for that specific matter. As perioperative practitioners, we must be knowledgeable in resource management utilization. 
we cannot demand what we need due to some limitations and challenges we are now facing. It is our role to look for a solution and find ways to meet our needs. This can be achieved by trust, good leadership, collaboration, and positive attitude. Above all, this endeavor should not compromise patients and healthcare worker safety. In addition, being an advocate for the patient and healthcare worker safety is crucial in delivering quality care. To be an advocate, we must learn to speak up. If non-conformance and errors are observed, while observing the proper process that needs to be employed. As part of the team, it is increasingly important to be equipped with knowledge and skills to render quality care in embracing the technological advancement and evidence-based practice that can help ensuring a safe workplace, like katulad nga na discuss ni Dr. Kanina, like environmental cleaning, processing of instruments, smoke, evacuator machine, etc. So we have the knowledge to prevent infection. What we lack is the will. So thank you <laughs> very much. Thank you, Gab. Thank you. Thank you, Gab. Thank you, Gab. Thank you Sir Gab. And now we will be uh, going to the Q&A portion of this. Uh, we have uh, still a few minutes. So um, anyone in the panel, um, uh, even our reactors can answer, no? Uh, the, of course, Dr. Asagil, no? <laughs> so uh, what is, there's a question here and I'm just going to group it all, no? So somebody is asking between the difference between uh, air exchanges per hour or uh, CADR clean air delivery rate for HEPA filters, no? I think, um, does anybody know? Uh, it sounds like a more an engineering question kasi, no? I'm sure Dr. Akulaik will be able to answer that better. Yeah. <laughs> um, as, um, as far as air exchanges are concerned, there are standard air exchanges that are based on room dimensions. No? So yeah. the depth of the room, the height of the room, if you have a door, what size is the door, the, the size of the window, the angle of the window to the room. There are quite a number of um, factors, I think, that are considered. And yes, it is an engineering question, which unfortunately I am not an engineer, but um, it is a question that we pose and that we do pose to our engineering staff when we um, are in the process of renovations or creating new rooms, especially when we want to create isolation rooms. You know? um, in, the, in the early days of uh, managing COVID cases outside of the OR, we're talking about the general hospital areas, uh, there has been a lot of emphasis on, on these. You know? If you don't have negative pressure rooms, what can we use? Um, because negative pressure rooms are expensive. They are an investment, quite a number. And you know, you can't just, if you do a negative pressure room, you'll find that one, two, or three are not even enough. So what are the options for that? And so DOH put out its guidelines that said, uh, well, you can just have single rooms in these cases, but you want to ensure the proper air exchange you know, at about 12. So at that point, the ones who will be able to truly identify the, the dimensions for these would be your engineers. No? And um, there have even been guidelines on what would help to improve that air ex uh, uh, exchange. Would it help with the uh, exhaust, opening your windows, opening their windows and your doors? No? But of course, we know that we cannot open the doors for our <laughs> patients when they are, in fact, um, in isolation. So the other option is the window. And that is an option provided that the window doesn't open to a highly populated area where there's a lot of foot traffic. So those, those recommendations have to come in. But as far as the air exchanges are concerned, that is an engineering concern. Now, the other one, the CADR, that's a, a spec of the machine. You know? These are the, the, the process by which the, 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 air, the air moves. Dr. mentioned that the HEPA filters, the air, the, the ha it has to go slow through that machine to be filtered out, to be cleansed, not to be the whole point of the filter. The HEPA filter is to, 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 to bind um, those pathogens. So the, the movement there is going to be a slower movement. Again, these are specs um, that should be uh, in the manufacturer's uh, manuals and should be reviewed uh, before purchasing, uh, uh, I, I presume, a HEPA filter for your facility. 
Yes, thank you, Dr. Akulaiko. And uh, I suppose you all, uh, by with your answer, we've already answered some of the questions asking about, um, you know, uh, installing a uh, exhaust fan instead of the true negative ru uh, pressure room or opening up the windows. No, there will be limitations, and we advise everyone to talk to their hospital engineers. No? So. Um, there's there's one question here in um, how in in requiring patients uh, to undergo RT PCR before elective <laughs> surgery. Um, Somebody is asking how how long can you have that RT PCR result uh, to be considered valid? Yeah, um, that's all, always going to be a tricky question. No? <laughs> going to be. Because it's always going to be a tricky question because you get one test today and then you get infected tomorrow. So it's really, it, it's very tricky. But um, the recommendation really is that if you will do an RT-PCR and, and um, it's still a recommendation for, for elective procedures, especially if the individuals come from high endemic areas or the prevalence of, uh, of COVID is high or the exposure in the, in the immediate environment is high. Um, but validity ideally is a week. No? Um, it's unfortunate that in many testing centers, the turnaround time is still it's a long week. time. Yeah, one week, yes, four <laughs> days, five days. Earlier on in, in, in March, April, we get it in two weeks, which is really <laughs> impossible. But now there are a lot of testing, uh, accredited testing centers that have been able to deliver uh, a turnaround time of 48 hours. Um, and so though it, it's a more feasible approach now. But the idea really is not more than a week from the time of the procedure. No, for, for for from the time of the elective uh, procedure. Uh, thank you, Doctora. And um, there was another question with regards um, uh, to the respirators that uh, most of the healthcare workers use nowadays. Mm -hmm. No, so um, unlike before, we just rely, we just only knew about the N95s. Now everybody's using. Full face uh, elastomeric half respirators, face. half face, just elastomeric. So, um, does uh, anybody in the panel want to answer this? How, how should how should it be cleaned? Do you do you have any special guidelines on how it should be cleaned? It's actually the manufacturer that will give you the appropriate guidelines on how to clean the respirators. For example, with the N95 ma masks, if you ask the manufacturer of the N95 mask, they'll tell you that. They don't want it being recycled or being or being reprocessed, but it was because of the shortage that uh, we decided that CDC, even the US CDC, decided that well, rather than not have any respirators, probably can recycle, but only for certain with certain uh, exclusions and in certain criteria. Same is true with respirators. I know somebody who bought one, a full face respirator, and used alcohol on the lens and. Voila, <laughs> it is now opaque and you cannot use it anymore. <laughs> so it's very important that the manufacturer's um, um, indications you know, or should be followed. Especially the general rule is sodium hypochlorite, uh, and a very dilute sodium hypochlorite solution is an ideal, and then you dry it properly. And of course, you change filters because, filters, especially yes. for those half face and full face respirators, mm -hmm. you cannot use it forever with the same filter. <laughs> Okay, so you also follow the manufacturer's uh, recommendations regarding changing of filters. Uh, oh, there are other hospitals now that have PAPRs, the purifiers, the powered air purifiers. Yeah. And I saw one hospital that said that they can just uh, borrow from one person to the other. You can use from one person to the other. And I don't think it's very hygienic. <laughs> I don't think, I think if you're going to uh, share PAPRs, yeah. you can share the motor, but you don't share the headpiece. The headpiece, yeah. <laughs> By yeah. your own headpiece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's rather, that is rather funny. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> Lalo na kung nagkakatain na ng garlic nung nauna sa'yo. Yeah. No? Shawarma yun. <laughs> Shawarma, yeah. Anyway, anyway, going back to our topic. Um, this is a part, uh, one question that I'm particularly fond of. Uh, in using UV light, um, will the 
people in the other room be affected with with UV light? Uh, mm -hmm. Other room? <laughs> yeah. A separate room? In 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 the separate room. Uh, if it's an enclosed room, um, then there should be no reason that the UV light will affect the next room. No? Remember, the reach also of the UV light is not very far. That's why uh, Dr. mentioned, Dr. Sagal mentioned, that the farther the objects that you want to clean or disinfect is from the, from the light source, then you might not really reach uh, the sterilizing point for that one. So... Um, I, I, I'm, I don't think you can affect the next room as long as the, the open the door is closed. closed. <laughs> yes, the door is closed. Uh, thank you. And, um, there, uh, are, there are many kinds of UV lights now. Yes. Huh? Aside from the UV lamps that you use to sterilize, you can even put UV inside your spit type air conditioning mm -hmm. to clean your room. So there are many applications now of UV lights. So it's very important that you check with the manufacturer or the distributor regarding the specifications. And also, if you're going to use UV lamps, you have to know also the dimensions of the room. Yes. So, because if you're going to use a very small UV lamp, but you have a very large ICU, that's not going to be effective either. So that's very important to know. Uh, thank you. And um, just to add on that, no, uh, we have to remember that UV is actually light, you know? so <laughs> the, the closer anything it, uh, you want to sterilize, the better. You know? yeah. kanya, hindi mo na siya nasisi, hindi mo nasisinagan yun, wala na siyang effect. You know? And UV lamps, UVC lamps, despite ve uh, being very effective, are also not uh, great in, in long distances. You know? So yeah. kung nasa kabilang parto ka, you're safe. Hindi siya tumatagos, hindi siya x-ray vision. No, no. Hindi no. <laughs> siya, ano. <laughs> Somebody's asking about a dry misting. Uh, I, I think those are the, you, one of the, those many ads you see on, on social media. No? They sell those fogger machines, misting machines. No? So do you, does anybody think that they are a good idea in... Um, hospital uh, disinfection, particularly in the o OR or ICU? Uh, um, Dr. Yeah, as far as the, the, the different, there are actually a lot of misting machines. No? One that has been, uh, been in the market even prior to COVID was really the hydrogen peroxide types. Yeah. No? And they have been effective in, in depending on the, the area that is being misted but um, some infection control uh, units would would use it for even um, sterilizing or disinfecting or disinfecting um, air vents you know, in a particular setting. Um, but it depends really, I guess, on what kind of misting machine that you would be using you know, because there really are some that were created for disinfecting uh, a particular uh, room, you no, know, a particular room. But there are a lot that have been coming out now, you no, know, with COVID and um, those misting tents uh, that a lot are been have been putting up. There really hasn't been any evidence of its effect, you no. Know, on and as a matter of fact, of course, we know that the DOH has advised against, against um, yeah, misting mm. the the healthcare worker, you no, know, because precisely what happened to that individual who had an allergic uh, anaphylactic reaction mm. to all of these um, misting uh, procedures. But um, to be fair, there are in fact machines that in the, it's been for uh, a few years already that they've been yeah. around for disinfecting um, rooms, no? uh, disinfecting rooms with hydrogen peroxide. Yes, um, in addition uh, from the lecture, remember the sequence of environmental sanitation. It's always clean, Clean. disinfect, sterilize. So to mist without wiping, without cleaning, mechanical cleaning, that would be in, uh, an incomplete cleaning and disinfection. So misting is a disinfecting uh, process, mm -hmm. but the cleaning, the mechanical cleaning should, always, should never be forgotten. I think misting falls also or would probably be an adjunct as well. Yeah, adjunct, just, yeah. Just like, the just like UV. UV. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, thank you. And um, how about um, th this one, Dr. Sagil, is, uh, I think is 
very apt uh, question for you. Are there separate <laughs> protocols for pe uh, pediatric patients who will undergo surgery, uh, oh, particularly no. neonates with surgical problems? Is we know that uh, thankfully, you no, know, they're they're not really strongly affected by COVID nineteen. But do they all need a, a PCR swab prior to a surgery? These pediatric patients. So just some, just some observations for the last six months. We've been lucky our pediatric patients were much less affected uh, in comparison to our adults. In PGH, we get to admit about 10 per week, of which nine would be have com uh, very serious comorbids like leukemias okay, and uh, major GI anomalies. But there are COVID positive neonates. And we just discussed one, a diaphragmatic hernia patient who tested positive for COVID at day three of life, even if the mother was negative. Okay, we were able to get the swab. So we were thinking, was the mother presymptomatic or did you get it uh, in the delivery room? And that baby developed cytokine storm. So my only point in saying that, in mentioning this, is you cannot totally discount the possibility of a neonate or a pediatric patient developing COVID infection. Uh, so far, right now, I have three COVID-positive appendectomies, okay? And these were all asymptomatic. Their uh, post-operative courses are so far uh, okay. So it does seem to follow the observation, even in the U.S. and in Europe, that children seem to be have, to have less respiratory symptoms in comparison to adults. But same, we still test. Even children, we test. And the problem with the children is we test the, the child and we have to test the mother or the caregiver. And now there's uh, evidence that there is some evidence that there's some transplacental transmission of, co of the coronavirus. And there's also some evidence that there is, there may be viral particles uh, in the um, breast milk, but so far they're not infective. So the current recommendations that now is it's still uh, safe to give breast milk to babies, even if the mother is COVID positive, as long as the proper precautions are taken. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, uh, you got muted. <laughs> yeah, you're there. Uh, a lot of the questions are um, coming in with regards to PAPR and uh, personal, uh, the doctors carrying their own personal respirators, or customary respirators. So um, should the hospital regulate what the doctors bring in, you know, there's a infection, uh, hospital infection control um, side there. No, if you are, if you bring your own respirator, you you bring that respirator from hospital A to hospital B. Maybe hospital B doesn't want you to bring to do that. No, so <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? Uh, <laughs> from the infection control standpoint. Um, it's really very hard to tell doctors don't bring it because they don't listen to you. you know? They'll always tell you, what if I get sick? Who's going to answer for that? No? So even the overalls, hazmats, you tell them not there's no need for that, they'll still wear it. So uh, I, I think the just more prudent uh, approach there is you can't really ban them from, from, uh, from using it. Um, but if they are, in fact, going to bring it from hospital to hospital, then they really have to disinfect that you know, um, after using an exposure uh, to, to their patients, um, especially because uh, the, the, the reason, it's, it's not just for your protection, but whatever you wear, you, you, you potentially infect. And I think that just has to be reiterated to all healthcare individuals. So it's not just doctors who wear them now, not even nurses, midwives, they, you know, they're walking around Manong's you know, nursing agents. Yeah. They're all wearing <laughs> they're all wearing it. So so yeah, it, it's very hard to to deregulate that from, from yeah. I believe many of the employees or staff were given these half face respirators more for their sense of for the peace of for mind the, rather yes, than for the actual mind. need. Okay? Yeah. And I really saw that they were they felt very taken care of when they were given these half face respirators. But as I was, I keep saying, all these infectious protocols have been in existence before COVID. Yes. And if you're going to say that if ever there is something that good, good that came out, or if it heightened the awareness of everyone regarding infection prevention and control. TB has always been there. 
pneumonia is always with there. These are airborne diseases. But we never took the correct precautions because they felt, but because COVID kills and it kills fast, it disables many of us, it spreads so fast, then our, um, we know that we all cannot let our guard down now because the consequences are so dire. And I'd like to mention, because you have quite a number of participants, so I didn't think about it now, no? um, Dr. Ra mentioned that it has been around for a very long time, um, putting patients in negative pressure rooms, especially TB, no? um, Capitari, TB, MDR, TB, and, and in the, the reality is even the healthcare workers really were not very careful about yeah. that. Um, and so lately we've been having, you know, the, the field cat. And I just want to reiterate that the TB is still the number one <laughs> killer. No, still. Yes. So, so yeah, it's very good that this has really heightened our awareness for infection control. Um, one of our board members in the Philippine Hospital Infection Control Society was saying the good thing, one of the good things that came out about from this is that in the past, only infection control practitioners actually knew what PPEs were. You know, what was yeah. PPE. Now even the the, the 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 merchants in the palenques know what PPEs are. You know? so there's really a heightened awareness that we need to, in fact, practice uh, good hygiene and and the very basics of infection prevention and control. Yeah. Uh, wow, I think uh, that was uh, a very up statement to to cut short our very uh, engaging discussion na medyo napapahaba na tayo um, <laughs> i just looked at the program and i saw oops uh, we're a few uh, several minutes uh, uh, over time already <laughs> so um we'll we'll probably be revisiting these this these situations again Partic there were a lot of questions about ultraviolet sea light no so Maybe that's a different um, uh, topic uh, later on. Um, and maybe, uh, um, Jobert, maybe we can uh, we can answer we can still answer those questions and provide the answers in the YouTube. We will give the answers in the YouTube channel. So that yes, they yes, be, yes. Okay. Yes. yes, we will. We will. We will, we will provide the, the answers. Yeah, we we can. Uh, no, we can parse through all the questions. We can. Um, maybe we can be answering them uh, one at a time, no? Yes. Para mas uh, magandang discussion, no? So, um, uh, with that, if you uh, permit me, uh, we can now proceed to um, the message from our uh, sponsors. Uh, they will be presenting an AVP and to be followed by the closing remarks uh, from Dr. Renato Montenegro, the regent in charge of uh, the Philippine College of Surgeons Committee on Surgical Infection. The heart, life's natural pump, and the center of human passion and compassion. At Medela, we combine these aspects. Through global partnerships with leading researchers, we transform valuable knowledge into innovative clinical solutions. For over 50 years, we deliver high quality Swiss medical vacuum solutions that now include adaptable surgical suction and convenient easy to use portable suction systems for various applications in hospitals, clinics or home care. Healthcare professionals value the reliability, user-friendliness, and quietness that come from Medela suction pumps. Continuing our success in developing cutting-edge solutions, we proudly present our next generation of suction pumps, basic and dominant flex. The power of choice is at your fingertips. You can choose 40 liters per minute for whisper quiet operation, 50 liters per minute for most applications, or 60 liters per minute for turbo performance. Optimized hygienic design allows for simplicity when cleaning. Swiss quality and reliability integrated in a functional and modern design. 
you also have the choice of fully compatible fluid collection systems and accessories. Basic and dominant flex. The solution for all surgical suction needs. The pioneering chest drainage therapy system, Topaz Plus, digitally measures air, fluid and pressure and customized negative pressure wound therapy enhances performance, patient comfort and controlling costs. Life is precious and it needs passionate people to provide progressive care, working in partnership to save lives. Medela is all about true customer care. When you call, we answer. If you look for advice, we provide assistance. If you need support, we train and instruct you. Basic and Dominant Flex, offering you the power of choice at your fingertips. Hygienic, reliable and user-friendly. All at a whisper. Contact us for more information. We'd like to now welcome Dr. Montenegro for the closing remarks. Hi. Good afternoon again. Um, Esther, before I close the session, I'd like to just ask you a simple question um, about your lecture. I, for one, want to actually review it. Are we going to upload this? Um, or is this going to be shown on YouTube? Yes, so, sir. This will be available on the official PSIS channel. Uh, OK, there, there it is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me first thank um, Dr. Esther again. I actually enjoyed your lecture, Esther, <laughs> and um, <laughs> your fan base is definitely increasing. And <laughs> surely we will invite you again. I also enjoyed, you know, the comments of Dr. Catherine. Yeah. And of course, Gab, uh, Gab, your message was rather philosophical. So to end the session, uh, again, to everyone, uh, we appreciate that you stayed online with us for the last one hour. It was a very fruitful one hour. Again, congratulations, Esther. And thank you again for graciously accepting the challenge to remind us, educate us, and reassure us that we are, in fact, doing our best in this crisis. Uh, this webinar is more than just a commitment of the Philippine Surgical Infection Society, the Perioperative Nurses Association of the Philippines, or the ORNA, and the PCS, of course. This also reflects our advocacy towards surgical infection prevention and awareness. Um, what we emphasize this afternoon is that for us to win the battle against COVID, we need to be educated. We need to be aware and continuing medical education, such as this uh, web-based seminar, is actually the way to go. And to repeat what the PCS president just said earlier, Last month, during the second, uh, rather last month, uh, last July, uh, during the second Saturday, we celebrated the first ever Surgical Infection Prevention Awareness Day, which culminated the one week celebration of the National Infection Prevention, Prevention. Control Week, mm -hmm. which always falls on the second week of July. Uh, this is of course to drum up support you know, for the Philippine Surgical Infection Society. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to, to finally end the session, uh, I would like to invite everyone in behalf of the Board of Directors of the Infection Society um, to be a member of our group. Um, everyone with a stake on surgical infection, nurses, surgeons, infectious disease specialists, operating room nurses, you are all welcome. Again, congratulations and a pleasant afternoon to all. Thank you. And a happy birthday, Bogie. Ah, happy salam. birthday! <laughs> it's a good way to, you know, celebrate my birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll, we'll, we'll have...
make every effort to answer all your questions. Yeah, I was afraid, uh, Chito, you'd say that. I was expecting that, Chito. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank sure. you, sir. Bye. Thank, thank you to all our participants. Thank you. Mm. For joining us this afternoon. All those who registered will receive an email with a link for the certificate of attendance and CPD credits. 